So our text this uh, morning is Galatians chapter 3, verse 15 through 25. We're working uh, towards this uh, verse in chapter 4. If you have your Bibles open, you can uh, look at that verse. We'll look at it in a few weeks. Um, This verse that says, But when the fullness of time had come, Verse 4, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. That phrase, when the fullness of time had come, it speaks of the birth of Jesus Christ. That time that God was going to fulfill his promise. That time when it became clear that There was no one righteous, no, not one, and no one was able to fulfill or keep uh, the word of God uh, perfectly uh, when the fullness of time had come, the time when it became clear that everyone was deserving of God's judgment. And in that time, God sends his son to receive a judgment upon himself. It's a time, beloved brothers and sisters, that Israel was waiting for, holding on to. Why? Because they'd been given a promise. I wonder how many of you forget a great promise quickly. Kids, maybe your parents give you a great promise, maybe about something that will happen on Christmas Day. Maybe it's something that happens when you're turning 18. They promise something, promise something so big. Maybe your parents have promised to buy you a car at 18. As soon as you turn 18, they're going to buy and give you a car. That's a great promise. How quickly would you forget that promise? Well, maybe if your parents had made that promise once, eventually you might forget it. But what if your parents repeated that promise several times over and over and over again? Do you remember it then? Would you hold on to that promise? Would you hold your parents accountable to that promise? What if life became really hard? Would you forget the promise? Or would you hold on to that promise even more? What if the promise was a car and you end up having to work and you're walking back and forth taking the bus? Would that excite you even more about the promise? I suspect most of us, kids and adults, if given a great promise by someone we expect to fulfill that promise, would not easily forget that promise, even if things change. Advent is the season of waiting for God to fulfill his promise. It's a season that anticipates the waiting for God to fulfill his promise. For us, it's the remembering that God actually did fulfill his promise in the birth of Jesus Christ. And it's a season that for the Israelites, especially the faithful Israelites who were still remembering the promise, who were still holding on to the promise, made them long for that promise all the more. It's an important part of the history of Israel. Why? Because there's this big chunk of the Old Testament, a big section of the Old Testament that's very dark, very discouraging, very frustrating for the people of God. It's the period of the law, the law of Moses. When was the law given? The law was given at Mount Sinai through Moses. God spoke to Moses. Moses is the intermediary in Galatians chapter 3. God spoke to Moses, and Moses... uh, presented the law of God to the people of Israel. And then for the period from Mount Sinai all the way up to uh, the birth, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, Israel is called or is spoken to be under the law. I say it's a dark and discouraging time in Israel's history. Why? Because it's in that period of history that you begin to see all the more clearly how ugly the human heart is. You see adultery, you see murder, you see prostitution, you see child abuse, you see sibling abuse, you see um, even to the end uh, a king 
offering his own child, child sacrifice. It's a very dark time as the law of God says, this is how you are to live, and then you look underneath that and you see just an ugliness of human heart and relationship. It's also a very discouraging time because throughout that time, God works with his people. He doesn't leave them or abandon them. He continues to call them back to say, no, this is the way. No, this is the way. And just when it seems like someone has figured it out or a generation has, has come to see exactly what they're supposed to do, it all falls apart again. Resets and the next generation once again, you see the ugliness. So why the law? That's the big question that's being dealt with in this passage. Why the law? Why this entire period in the Old Testament of the law? There's some today that would like to say, you know what, let's not even spend any time thinking about the Old Testament. It's a God of wrath. It's a God of darkness. It's a God of judgment. We don't understand it. It's a different God. It's a different time. We don't even want to think about it. Well, that attitude is contrary to Scripture and contrary. It's against what Paul writes here. He says, no, there's a point, there's a purpose, and I want you to understand it. So we are going to be exploring that question, why the law? We're going to ask uh, the question of ourselves, are you still captive under the law or captivated by Christ? We're going to see three things. The law doesn't annul the promise. The law showed our need to believe the promise. And the law held Israel captive to the promised Christ. The law doesn't annul the promise. This is verse uh, 15 through 18 where the Apostle Paul, he says, to give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Once there's a, a, a will or once there's a, a contract that's been put in place, that's been ratified and signed and sealed, you can't just make changes to it. And the point here is certainly God can't or God doesn't. He doesn't just change the rules. He's immutable. He's the unchanging God. He's not one day uh, this way and then another way, day that way. If we think about the scripture, it is one story. This is one story of one God bringing one salvation into one world in one way for all people. And that salvation is promised to Abraham. So how does that work? To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls or adds to it once it's been ratified. So then the question is, okay, how does the promise fit with the law? In verse 16, Paul writes, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. So uh, this goes back to Genesis 12, Genesis 15, 17, 22, where God says to Abraham, I will bless you and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in your offspring. Now Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob had the 12 uh, sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. And there are many Israelites, many offsprings, plural, that come from Abraham. But Paul here is saying, now let's not get confused. When, Paul, when God made that promise to Abraham, he didn't intend all of the people of Israel. He intended one child of Israel. The world wasn't going to be blessed through all of the people of Israel. No, what the Old Testament shows is the old people of Israel are actually not a blessing to the world. They're selfish. They're self-centered. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring, and it does not say to offsprings referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, and then Paul says, and that person is Christ. God promised to Abraham all nations will be blessed, and this is a promise to you and to your offspring, and that offspring is Jesus Christ. The birth of Jesus Christ is where God fulfills his promises to Abraham. And this is what I mean, he says in verse 7, the law which came 430 years afterward does not 
annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. In other words, just because the law came doesn't mean God switched up or took back the promise. He didn't promise a great thing that people were holding on to and then said, okay, now you've got to work for it. If that was, if that was what happened, there would be legitimate frustration. If your parents promised to give you a car for your 18th birthday, they can't on your 16th birthday say, okay, now you have to work full time and earn all of the money for the car so that you can buy the car. Otherwise, you're not going to get the car. That's not a promise anymore. It's not a promise gift given freely and graciously. The inheritance, says Paul, comes, if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by a promise but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. I hope you're understanding exactly what Paul is saying here. He is saying when God makes a promise, he's going to fulfill the promise. And you can hold on to that. You can hold on to that even though there's this period of the law and Israel could hold on to that even though there was this period of the law. That God made the promise. God was going to fulfill the promise. And I might not see it. I might not feel like it's going to be possible. But I can believe. Why? Because God doesn't change. He did not and he never does annul the promise he makes. So there's two points I'd like you to remember from this. First, it's a theological point. The Bible teaches a continuity to God's covenant, not a discontinuity. There's a system of thought called dispensational theology that in extreme form cuts up the Bible and says, God works here in this way, God works here in another way, God works here in another way. And there's one way for the Israelites and there's one way for the church of Jesus Christ. But this passage clearly shows that God is one God working through one covenant with one promise that he fulfills in Jesus Christ. And that way, that one way is for all people, for Jews and for Greeks, for you and for me. And then the second practical one, the second practical point to remember is know and focus on the promises of God. They will be fulfilled. Kids, when your parents make a great promise to you, you're going to hold on to that, especially if they repeat it. How much more as you hear the promises of God and as your parents remind you of the promises of God made to you in baptism, how much more do you hear those promises and say, yes, these are promises for me and God will fulfill them, even though I may not see, even though I may not see how I can make it all happen or that I deserve it or that I could possibly earn it, or live up to it. The law doesn't annul or replace God's promises. So then the second question, our second point, why the law? Why the law? What's the whole point of the law then? If God was going to promise and God was going to fulfill the promise, why the law? Verse 19 and 20. It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. Why the law? It was added because of transgressions. And the word choice, I think, here is significant. That word transgressions means a breaking of the law. It's not not the word sin. Sometimes these words are used interchangeably, sin and transgression. But here I think it's intentional. It was added because of transgressions. In other words, the law was put in place to make clearly known what sin looked like. God drew the line on the tablets of stone and said, you shall not do this. I remember when I was little, this is wrong, but I knew there were certain things that I shouldn't do, but my parents had never said I shouldn't do them. Now, maybe 
all of you in your youth, or maybe you kids are better than I am, but I always thought, well, that's a little gray area. My parents never actually said I shouldn't. So why don't I? And then only afterwards, mom and dad say, well, you shall not do this. You should not do this. Once that rule was set, then I knew, okay, don't cross that boundary anymore. Why? Because once that rule is in place, it becomes clear to you and to others that you are crossing a line. There's a line that has been set, and you are crossing that line. The law was put in place, says Paul, because of transgression. It's through the law that we become aware, and God holds us accountable that you're actually crossing the line. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You don't do that. You are crossing a line. Not just morally are you committing uh, evil, but also legally you have crossed the line. You have broken the law. You see, it's through the law that God showed Israel how bad things really were. How sinful their heart really was. And it wasn't just Israel in the Romans, and it's not uh, our focus, but in Romans, uh, Paul talks about the Gentiles who have uh, the law written on their heart and their conscience bears witness, also accusing them. But the law shows how desperately we need the promise to be fulfilled. Going back to our example, if your parents promise you a car and you don't think you need their promise, then what's the point of holding on to that promise? If God lays out before the people of Israel, do this and live, and the people think they can do it, why do they need God to do it? But no, what the law actually does is it says, do this and live, and the people realize there's no way we can possibly do it. There's no way we can possibly earn our salvation. There's no way we can possibly restore our relationship with God. And with God. There's no way we can possibly find our way back into heaven. The law makes that clear. The law teaches us humility and a need to plead for God's mercy. There's one commentator that said, Satan would have us prove ourselves holy by the law, which God gave to prove us sinners. You see, Satan says, see, here's what God says you must do, and you can do it. Just start working really hard. And God says, no, I've laid it out before you so that you can see how much you need me, how much you need my grace, how wonderful and how rich that promise is I gave to you. I gave this to you so that you would start holding on to that promise ever more tightly. And that's what he calls us to. That's what he calls you to in this life of faith. If you're not a believer, he calls you not to think you can change your life, but to hear the promises of God given in Jesus Christ. Believe in me, you are forgiven, and you will be made new by the Spirit. He calls you to, to grab onto those promises. If you're a new believer, he calls you to hold on to those promises and to rejoice in those promises and to guard yourself against thinking that I have to make those promises happen. The law showed our need to believe the promise, to hold on to that promise. That's what's going to get you through the difficult, dark days of life. When you're faced with your own failures, when you're overwhelmed by the things you've done in the past, 
It's the bright promise of God that's fulfilled in Jesus Christ in whom all of the promises of God are fulfilled. It's that promise that's the light of the world in Jesus Christ, the fulfillment in him. You see, what Paul concludes with as we go to the third point is one, the law, it didn't annul the promise. It didn't change the contract at all. No, what it did is it showed us our need to believe that promise. And as it did so, it held us captive to the promised Christ. The law held Israel captive to the promise. Verse 21 through 24, 25, is the law then contrary to the promise? Certainly not. You see, the promise and the law both promise the same thing. The law says, do this and live. God God says, I will bless you. He says, if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. God wasn't saying something completely different. He was simply showing how it would become possible. The destination, a life of righteousness, of love, and of of fullness in full relationship with God and others is what the promise was, and it is what the law said. This is what you need to do in order to have that happen. But we couldn't do it. Israel didn't do it, wouldn't do it, couldn't do it. And yet, the beauty of the law is it held the people captive to that promise. Scripture imprisoned everything under sin, Galatians 3, verse 22, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The Scripture and and the law of Moses, as this great promise of God is given to the people of Israel, And and humanity wonders in their sinful pride, do we even need God? Do we even need his promises? What the law and what the scripture does is it takes all of humanity and says, well, all of you are under God's judgment, are deserving of the curse. This is where everyone belongs. Jews and Greeks, there's no group, no culture, not even one single person that didn't need the promise of God. Why? Because no one could become righteous under the law. No one could achieve that glorious vision of a perfect life of love in relationship with God and others. Before faith came, Galatians 3, verse 23, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. The law isn't contrary to the promise, but rather it keeps the promise front and center. It reminded the people of Israel, and it continues to remind you and me today why we needed God's promise. And why, as the law is is there. We don't want to be held captive under the law, but we want to be captivated by the promise of God. The law which points to that need for the promise shows to you and to me uh, that on any given day as we wake up and as we rise with confidence that we humbly bow before God and we say, Lord, you be gracious to me. Fill me with your spirit. I need you every day hour fulfill your promise in me and do not allow me to stray from you for even one moment for then I would be lost it's through the law we seek more eagerly the person through whom the promise is fulfilled Because you and I know that we're not those people. You and I know that when we hear the law, as we think about what God calls us to, how he causes us to love others as we love ourselves, we can't even do it ourselves. 
And so we seek more eagerly the person through whom the promise is fulfilled. That's why when Jesus was born, there's these, there's Anna and there's Simeon in the temple. They're eagerly waiting for the Messiah. They're waiting for that promised one. They're under the law, but they're captivated by the promise. The law continues to just drive them back to that promise to say, Lord, when is the Messiah coming? And then when they see him, they sing. They sing because it's clear God is good. He's gracious. He does give generously. Some of you may know the poem by, it's credited to John Bunyan. The original source is sometimes hard to know. Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. The law didn't annul the promise. The law actually showed the need for the promise. And then the law held people captive to that promise, continuing to long for it all to be fully and finally fulfilled. As Israel realized and all of humanity came to see that it wasn't in us. Now, this timeline of human history, of Israel's history, is often mirrored in our Christian life. Oftentimes, especially as we come to faith in Jesus Christ or find the joy of faith in Jesus Christ, we rejoice that it's freely given to us. But so often, Satan tempts us, tempts us to shift our eyes from the promise fulfilled to the things we do. And so in that sense, as Paul talks about this entire history of the Old Testament, he's also speaking to your heart. He's saying, do you want to know, do you want to hold on to the promises in Jesus Christ all the more tightly? Then don't avoid the law. There's a catechism question in answer 15. Why is the Ten Commandments preached so strictly? The answer given throughout our life, we may become more and more aware of our own sinful nature and therefore seek more eagerly the forgiveness of sins and righteousness in Christ. And then as we continue to see what that looks like, praying to God for the grace of the Holy Spirit, we may never stop striving to be renewed more and more after God's image. As we see the promise that God fulfills in Jesus Christ, and then as we hear again the law, now from a different perspective, we might say, yes, that's the kind of person I want to be. That's the kind of people that I long for my neighborhood to be, for our society to embrace. A world that loves the Lord God with all heart, soul, mind, and strength, and people who love each other as much as they love themselves. That's a story of scripture. That's the one story of scripture. That's the one way of salvation that we find in Jesus Christ. It's something promised. It's something that the law points to. And it's something that God fulfills in Jesus Christ. And it is for you and me also today. As we hear the promise and receive it by faith. Amen.